Um, hi, I'm Sydney Jackson Clarkson. I'm the host for the symposium. So welcoming you all who I'm excited to announce digging into decolonization in a global network, a case study for accountability. Today we have Shayon, Amardi, and Rachel joining us, and I'm going to pass the floor off to you all. Welcome. Thank you so much, Sydney, and thank you everyone for joining this session and also for creating this space for dialogue. Um, we're really pleased to be here. So just to outline what we have planned for this session um, before we do our various introductions, um, we're, we're approaching this as um, three people engaged in decolonization work within a global network, and we all represent different roles um, within that work. And so we want to present um, our work. Uh, so kind of three different presentations from the three of us before we move into a Q&A session. So we'll just, we'll just introduce ourselves um, before we jump into the, the presentations. Um, so uh, Amadi, do you want to start? Hi, everybody. Thanks so much, Rachel. Appreciate you framing up that session and the, the session for everybody as well. Um, I am dialing in from the UK. Um, I'm based in, in Reading in the UK and I'm the director of the Raja. Um, the Raja is the consultancy um, organisation that the INEE has engaged as part of their work um, to, to explore kind of decolonization and what it might mean for their network. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about how we organizationally approach that and, and our ethos and practice a little bit later, but just to share a little bit more detail about our work, we work really critically through two streams of work. We're a collective of, um, we're a women-led collective of black and brown practitioners that work in social development. So some work locally, regionally, nationally, internationally. Um, and our work has two key streams. We offer consultancy and strategic advice for organizations. And we also have a community of practices support us while we're trying to do work for systemic, um, to, to address systemic inequity in the ways it's showing up in places and spaces that we occupy or are invited into. Um, that's, uh, we'll, we'll get a little bit more into it um, as we go, but for now I'll hand over to Shayon. Hello everyone, thanks for coming to our session. So my name is Sean Adebayo, I'm from Nigeria, currently uh, finishing my PhD uh, at the School of Education, University of Galway, and I'm also an active member of INI, and I've also um, you know, performed some consultancy on anti-racism and decolonization, and I'll be sharing some of the findings from that research work with INI, and then my own journey towards global education and international development. Yeah, thank you. Over to you, Rachel. Thanks, Shion. Thanks, Amadeep. Um, so my name is Rachel Smith. I am a coordinator on the, the INEE Secretariat. So we coordinate the work of the network. Um, and my specialism or my focus is around psychosocial support and social and emotional learning. Um, and I'm based in the UK. I'm in London. I'm going to share some slides and just... Um, just kind of to introduce who we are first of all and then I'm going to just speak a little bit about the work or the timeline of the work um, that we've been engaged in thus far. Um, so INEE is this open global network and um, we're made up of, of stakeholders across the education in emergencies ecosystem so from affected populations, schools, teachers, universities, research institutes to um, government representatives, um, NGOs, you name it. And um, INEE was launched in the year 2000, so it's 22 years old um, by now. And we're not, um, we're not an incorporated organization. We don't have our own legal identity. We are a hosted network and we're hosted by the International Rescue Committee. And they um, kind of, do uh, provide for us the kind of administrative infrastructure um, that allow us to do our work and have the the oversight and the fiscal sponsorship. Um, but we are we are made up of our members and um, the INEE 
approach or stance is that that allows us to have more neutrality um, in the way that we work and to be able to be more flexible and adaptable. Um, so as I said, INE has existed since 2000. It was um, conceptualized during the um, World Education Forum in, in Dakar. Um, and here we are kind of 22 years later. We are, we now have over 19,000 individual members, um, over 4,000 organizations in 190 countries. Um, and we are also staffed by a secretariat who coordinates um, these different network spaces. So as I mentioned, I coordinate a network space, a working group around psychosocial support and social and emotional learning. But we also have working groups on gender, on inclusive education, on distance education, on data and evidence. Um, and these groups have emerged through member needs um, and the field saying, you know, we, we want to focus on this particular area within education in emergencies. Um, so INEE says it exists for and because of its members. Now, I want you to kind of remember who the members are as well, right? And the complexity of that. Within our membership, we have funders, donors, we have ministries of education. So we'll get in a little bit more into the complexities of that later, but when we say we are led by our members and driven by our members, of course, there are very particular dynamics that come into play there um, and thinking about what decision making might look like across the network or in a network space, depending on people's positionality, power, et cetera, is something that is very complex within a network and, and, and something that probably resonates with others on this call. Um, next slide, please. Emma, do you, are you doing a slide? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> no. um, so one of the foundational texts of INEE is, is the INEE minimum standards. And if you're familiar with um, the humanitarian aid work and development, you're probably familiar with other sets of humanitarian standards like the sphere standards. So the INEE minimum standards um, are, are designed around, um, you know, the most minimal level of access to quality um, education in emergencies. And the first set, the first like iteration of this handbook um, was developed um, through a hugely consultative process with workshops um, across the globe. And so, you know, when it says developed by more than 3,500 educationalists, we're talking about sort of all these workshops coming together um, and all these inputs coming together to develop the first iteration of this handbook. That was then revised again in 2010, and we're currently going through another update of the minimum standards. And Shiona is going to speak um, to a specific part of that process as well. Um, but just to kind of highlight this as a, a core text in which, you know, um, we talk a lot in INE about having global goods and then contextualizing or adapting them um, to the needs of, of the context and the communities where they're being used. Um, but there's another tension there is that universal versus um, local and where as well this kind of knowledge is produced um, to arrive at these minimum standards. So now jumping into a timeline of the work that INE has been engaged in when it comes to anti-racism and decolonialities. So unsurprising probably to most, this work really kicked off in June, 2020. Um, every sector was having a reckoning at this point, the beginning of the this kind of Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and it was a, there were lots of internal conversations happening within the secretariat. And I want to say that the INE secretariat at that time was largely staffed um, by people in the global north, in the US and in Europe. Um, and there were very few people of color within um, the secretariat as well. So just picturing what those conversations might look like at that time. 
Um, and so some of us within the Secretariat, not at a, at a leadership level, um, wanted the INEE to start engaging in these conversations. And those started at a Secretariat level, um, but we realized very quickly, no one felt particularly equipped to lead these conversations, right? Kind of going in circles, not really sure what we mean when we use certain terms, not all on the same page, um, not all of the same uh, place in our journeys in engaging in anti-racism work. So we brought in a consultant early on in August to, um, 2020, um, who helped us to have some of these, to workshop some of these conversations, developing a set of recommendations for how INEE can move forward with, with its work on anti-racism. At the same time, we were producing this statement on anti-racism and racial equity, which I can share these links in the chat in a moment, um, outlining 10 commitments to how we would move this work forward. Um, but without that coming from the leadership level, it kept kind of fizzling out. There are a few of us within the Secretariat who are trying to lead these conversations um, and develop this action plan and trying to hold each other to account um, with living up to these commitments and actioning these commitments. Um, but it was, it was really slow, painful work. And a lot of these conversations kept focusing in on um, terminology. It was very clear, again, that we would not that the, there was no one within the Secretariat who was able to lead this work, um, who was qualified enough to lead this work, who was comfortable enough to lead this work. Um, so it, this kind of fizzled out a little bit. At the same time, um, myself and some members were attending some other forums, some reading group around called uh, Decolonizing EIE, Education Emergencies with a question mark. So like, is it possible? Let's discuss. So um, a number of us were attending this reading group separately, and then we came together and we said, oh, you're INEE as well. Okay, you're an INEE member. Um, what do we do about INEE not engaging with this and certainly not saying very much to the membership? Um, so following that, we designed, I think we can go to the next slide. Um, we convened this meetup, a virtual meetup, around this topic decolonizing education emergencies. Um, and we held it in INE languages, which are Arabic, French, English, Spanish, and Portuguese. And we had no funding for this. So there was no budget available to run a multilingual event. So we relied very heavily on our members and their labor to help us um, facilitate a, uh, an event in five languages. We tried to keep it short, having a, a short plenary in English with, with um, simultaneous interpretation, then we went out into breakout groups per language. Um, off the back of that, myself and these three other members um, put out a call for expressions of interest to set up a network space. So we have a network space on gender, on you know um, psychosocial support, on all these other topics, but nothing around anti-racism or decoloniality. We put out a call for expressions of interest and we, got 157 members responding. Now that probably doesn't seem like a great number considering the size of the network, but in terms of how many people respond to these kind of calls, it was it was quite a high number of people. Um, really, there was a lot of kind of powerful statements um, that came through those that, that response. Um, so then we, Said, okay, we need funding behind this. Um, this call to action shows what the membership wants from us. Um, so we, the same little group, we put together this call to action to our steering group um, and calling for them to resource, um, re resort for resourcing to meet the demand for network spaces and activities on decolonizing education and emergencies. And very quickly, the steering group mobilized some funding towards that. Um, and through that, we were able to bring in Amadeep and her team. And also at the same time, as I said, um, an update to the minimum standards, we were having reviews through different lenses. So we were having a review through a lens of the climate crisis and through gender. And so we wanted to review the minimum standards through a lens of anti-racism and decoloniality 
which is when we engage with, with Sheon as a consultant um, to do that piece of work. So that is our, a little bit of our journey. Um, and now I want to hand over to Sheon to talk about the movement standards part. So much, Rachel. Um, yeah, just picking up from where she stopped, um, I uh, just want to just share a bit of uh, my experience and journey and how I got to, you know, and, you know how I end up, you know, reviewing the minimum standards uh, through anti racism and decolonization uh, lenses. Um, so um, I'm from Nigeria and in 2015, uh, I left Nigeria for the first time to do a joint master's degree program in education and global development uh, in Europe. And that was a whole new experience for me. I got I really, you know, interested in global education and research. And I was also introduced uh, to the INI uh, and the minimum standards, as, as Rachel mentioned, uh, a minimal level of access to quality education in emergencies. You know, coming from Nigeria, we've had a bit of crisis and some, some part of Nigeria is still kind of uh, classified under uh, emergency context in the northern part of the country. So being very passionate about that, um, and I saw the minimum standards as this, you know, really wonderful text and of 19 standards and you know, um, and wonderful domains that can be applied in context uh, to you know context of uh, emergencies, and then having to understand this global network. And as a master's student, I engaged the minimum standards to the extent that it also informed my master's thesis, where I conducted research in in, in uh, post-conflict Liberia. Um, so, you know, being in Liberia, I'm looking at quality education and, and teacher development. And after my master's program or during the course of my master, I became a member of the INI network. I became quite active um, in some of the uh, uh, some of the work being done by INI, joined the reference group. I worked closely with with Rachel, and and um, and thereafter, I was engaged as a consultant to review the minimum standards uh, through anti-racism and decolonization lenses. And then having, now, having the opportunity to go deep into this minimum standards and, uh, and so many things became quite you know, um, revealing that you know, from a document I see as you know, quote, you know, quote, this wonderful document, and then looking at it from the anti-racism and decolonization, I began to see some gaps and that actually made me to reflect you know, on, on the work itself. And the network, um, but but I must I must mention that you know um, INI is quite very quite pro proactive in you know having this conversation and even looking at revising the minimum standards and you know seeing the important role of anti racism and decolonization of uh, decolonization values you know in, in revising the minimum standards. So the question that came up from that process of uh, of of you know reviewing the minimum standards through anti-racism and decolonization that is this, are these standards you know the baseline for education emergency or a benchmark and it depends on you know how practitioners engage with these wonderful documents. Um, so that next slide please. Thanks, so much. So I just want to quickly share because, uh, like, like we mentioned in the beginning of this session, that we would like to create room for discussions and and to engage with the audience. So I just want to share some, you know, um, summary of the findings from the review of the minimum standards through anti-racism and decolonization uh, um, lens. Um, I, I need to mention that the uh, standard, uh, the minimum standards were last reviewed in 2010. So it's about a almost 11, 10, 11 year gap now that a, an update has been done. Uh, so the, the first finding is the limitations and dominance of the English language as a lead language in the writing of the minimum standards. And uh, I, I felt, you know, part of my report to, to the network is there was a a limited reflection on the Western monopoly of, of, of English language, because this document is used majorly in the global South in emergency you know, context. So there is that limitation and uh, or reflection of uh, uh, the dominance of English language. Uh, there's also the lack of, um, all right. Okay, yes, thanks. So there's also the lack of critique on the source of knowledge and ideas being used in developing the minimum standards. 
uh, you know, applying for the uh, for the consultancy role, I made it known that you know with this work, I would like to engage indigenous knowledge systems in trying to look at you know trying to challenge you know the the Western monopoly of knowledge production, who defines knowledge, and how is how is you know, how is knowledge being conceptualized, and for who is it being conceptualized for? So those are the questions that I think that I had you know prior to engaging you know with with, with the review itself. So there was this, you know, limited critique on the source of knowledge and ideas being used in developing the minimal standards. There were challenges of contextualizing the, the international legal instruments, you know, informing the minimum standards in the emergency context. So the issue of contextualization, and that's why I had that is the minimum standard a benchmark or a baseline. And personally, my, my quick response that it's, it's a baseline, it's a, it's, a, it's a baseline minimum standard. So it wasn't called maximum standard, thankfully. It was called minimum standard, just, you know, but from what I have seen from engaging other practitioners or members of the network, particularly in the global south, it, it's easy to have these documents as, you know, as the, the benchmark. <laughs> And not really, you know, and 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 that and that itself can be quite problematic in some in some contexts, particularly when you're looking at contextualization, you know, differences in social, cultural, political, you know, our values of of, of context. Um, so the challenge of trying to contextualize some of the international legal instruments, you know, informing the minimum standard was something that also came out from my review. Um, some legal instruments were missing in the minimum standards. Um, surprisingly, and that actually showed the gap uh, when it comes to anti-racism and decolonization of values uh, um, being considered in the minimum standards, because we see that the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, you know, was established, uh, was formulated in 2007. So I guess, you know, when the standards were being revised in 2010, you know, there was no consideration. Our recognition of the needs to also reflect, like you know, the declaration of cultural diversity, um, and, and the elimination of all forms of of, of racial discrimination. Um, the 2015 SDGs uh, are relatively new, uh, so that is understandable. Uh, but you know, now that this review has been done, I think the updates. Uh, the update team or the process is considering you know the reports of the anti-racism and decolonization. Uh, you know, review. Uh, there's also the limited, like I said earlier, the limited appreciation for diverse and local knowledge sources in education policy making. So I had to develop a rubric um, in revising the minimum standards, and I was very particular about the source of knowledge. You know, where the knowledge is coming from. Also looking at you know, interrogating the literature, uh, the policy documents that 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 that, uh, that was ex that, that I reviewed. You know, in in conducting the thematic, you know, uh, re uh, and a review of this minimal standards, looking at how if authors actually declare that positionality and this, you know, and, and who is involved in the research. So um, just just to also highlight that this was a bit missing in the minimum, in the current edition of the minimal standards. And, and lastly, there was also the limited engagement of key concepts such as equity, race, power, power relations, cultural diversity, inclusion, racism. Like you can count, you know, how many times these keywords were used in, in a you know almost 190 something page page document. Or um, uh, so that also reflect the knowledge and practice of you know, race anti-racism, the limited knowledge and, and the practice of anti-racism and decolonization in the uh, um in the document itself. Um next slide please. So lastly, I'm aware that there are organizations being represented, they're interested in also engaging you know, anti-racism and decolonization lenses in their work or reviewing their operations. So I just want to just round off the, my presentation by sharing some practical approaches for organizations interested in this work. Uh, and I'm sure Amadip will also share more you know, in terms of operations. I, I think the first thing is about positionality, You know, being very critical of positionality. Um, we is defining the concept for us because I personally believe that whoever defines the concept can also determine how this concept will be engaged and all the results of, of this definition. So questions such as, you know, whose interest are these conceptualizations made? Who is, decide, who is deciding what knowledge is implemented? So we need to be very mindful of that. 
and also the need to engage indigenous knowledge systems in identifying what is essential for strengthening you know, uh, your work in anti-racism and decolonization, um, actively you know, searching for knowledge that challenges Western monopolies of knowledge and practice. It could be, you know, uh, it could be actually looking at you know literature or, 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 or knowledge that is not in English language, you know, just going that extra mile. I think is one of the vital lessons um, you know, from my, my review uh, of the minimum standards. And also important for me to mention that you know, anti-racism efforts will be more effective when it is action-oriented systemic change uh, to address the issues of racism and, and social oppression. And lastly, the colonization work must be a lifelong you know, engagement. Uh, it, it shouldn't just be another metaphor to just a rubber stamp that, okay, we have used the word decolonization or anti-racism in, in our operations. Uh, that means we have we have arrived. No, but it must be a, a lifelong engagement and commitment. So I'm just going to stop there and, uh, and hand over to uh, Hamadi. Oh, thanks so much, Sean. Um, Rachel, would you would it be all right for me to ask you to do the slides? Thank you. As you can tell, I've got uh, my my. My fingers a bit quick sometimes if I'm slide, slide sharing. So always appreciate having having a team member do it for me. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so when we are, I'm going to move into thinking about um, a little bit about us, um, our practice, um, what it what it what it looks like, um, and I'm going to start by sharing a little bit about us as an as an organisation. So we're uh, we can pop to the next slide, thanks. Um, so we're a women led collective of Black and Brown practitioners, and we're from the UK and and from the global south. So we work across different roles in social development, and as you can tell from our work with the INEE, we work with a whole range of organisations that are based in the UK. Uh, based internationally, working in, in spaces a bit like the INE, right, where there's lots of complexity around how oppression might show up in the room. Again, like I shared, we're a collective and everybody's got jobs in different places and spaces. Um, but the core thing that connects us as practitioners is this understanding of structural inequity that we have, and we really seek to address it by recentering vulnerable and marginalized communities in, in, in our work. Um, and the idea is that actually we can enable really relevant and meaningful impact by by making sure that it is driven by the communities that it is most seeking to serve, right? Um, and we also we also provide a lot of support to each other as well, which I think um, some of us in the room may be familiar with the fatigue of being the one person in an organization that is seeking to drive or, or shift practice, right? So doing systems change work within very rigid or structured organizations is extremely taxing. And so part of our work is about bringing together practitioners who might have disparate work streams in different places to just find some community sometimes as well, right? To, to, to remind ourselves that, you know the sky is indeed blue. One of our one of our colleagues, um, the director of a of a of an anti racist school based charity called Class Thirteen. One of the things he always says is that you need someone in the room with you to tell you that the sky is blue, that you're not going, that, you know, it's not just you, the sky is still blue. And sometimes when we are seeking to do systems change work, we can start to like doubt ourselves, right? We can start to doubt ourselves like, wait, is it really, does it, am I going, like everybody's telling me I'm wrong, but actually there's, a, there is so much value in having a community around you to support that practice. And so that's one of the reasons we exist. So we offer consultancy and strategic advice, much like we're supporting with the INEE work, as well as having that internally focused care and community practice internally as well. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So I just wanted to share a little bit about our methodology. Um, and I could talk about our methodology all day, but I want to talk a little bit about how we translate it into practice as, as well. So our methodology is informed by, first up, Black feminist thought, right? So one thing that we understand is that Black women have repeatedly and continuously and consistently created and shared ways of understanding systemic oppression. 
So our practice understands colonialism, racism, sexism as systems of oppression in and of themselves that are overlapping and intersecting. So we use the work of Patricia Hill Collins. We use the work of Kimberly Crenshaw because we don't want to re we we don't want to reinvent the wheel, right? People have already done this labor, and we will uplift and share that labor wherever we can. Um, but it's very important for us that we we name it and we celebrate it while also recognizing that we're using it to do things that are practical rather than leaving things in that theoretical space. Um, one of the core things that I just want to underline about why we why we work based on on black feminist thought as as a as a methodological underpinning is the understanding that actually this understanding of systemic oppression is born out of a need for self determination, right? And I think that was that was what was coming through in in Sha what Sharon was sharing with us, right? Is that actually quite often what colonialism, racism steals from us is our capacity to 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 determine things for ourselves, right? And be driven by our own ways of knowing and speaking and sharing. Right? And so, really grounding into that understanding of self determination is core for us in our practice. Next up, I want to talk about critical participatory action research. And again, this is just rooted in the belief that those most impacted should take the lead in framing what the questions, design, methods, changes look like when we are looking to effect change. The reason we talk about critical participatory action research and not just participatory action research is because we also want to center our understanding on understanding of power, right? Because we can say, hey, let's give communities back power. If we don't give them any resources or decision making, what does that actually mean, right, in reality? So that we are seeking to be participatory. One of the things that is going to be core for that to be meaningful is that it is coupled with an understanding of power, right? Otherwise, we land in a space where it is just extractive and lip servicey one of a better phrase so really here we're seeing what is emerging is a practice that is very explicitly saying nothing about us without us and finally I wanted to talk about us moving into we use lots of systems designs tools in our work as well one of the things that we find with practice around decolonization and 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 anti-racism is sometimes people can start to the people that need to go on the journey the most so those with power um, and with a very fixed type of positionality there's not there is a limited engagement with understanding the problem and a desire to jump forward to leap into solutions and what we find is that using systems designs tools allows us to hold both of those truths at once that we must look and see at what is happening before we move into designing what's next but we will for sure move into designing what's next because I think that's one of the things that can make this really hard for those that have traditionally held power is that there is a feeling of being barraged by looking at the problem because they've never done it before and the desire to jump forward into looking at solutions and looking systemically is is a way in which we seek to circumvent some of that and while all also allowing us to like quite often when we think of anti-racism we can think of like a very heavy and loaded practice that is um that is very much thinking always about hardship and about pain but when we think about people who experience racialization there is a lot of joy there is a lot of alternate realities that exist a lot of indigenous knowledge to lean into there are 101 things about um about that experience that is rich and joyful and we find that sometimes allowing us to hold both of those truths at once enables a, a stronger sense of, of moving forward in in that way also can we move forward to the next slide um one of the things that we've talked about briefly is is positionality and and Sharon did a really good good kind of exploration of of positionality is as part of this work and I want us to think about our own positionality as and again I know you're a lot of practitioners that are looking at this work um in different in different ways and one of the things that one of the reasons that we acknowledge that our that our collective is led by people based in the UK is that we in and of ourselves also have power right and there are there is power that we have access to um we experience the oppression that we seek to address as an organization but we also have the capacity to perpetuate it in different ways the task of resisting our own 
oppression does not relieve us of the responsibility of acknowledging our complicity in the oppression of others. Lots of, lots of you work in so, the social good space, in the social good space, right? That we're doing good things. We're not working for like, you know, we're not working for insert corporation here. I'm sure the session's being recorded. I probably shouldn't name any, right? But in so, you know, we're not working for big corporate, for corporate organizations earning big bucks, right? So there, there is something that emerges in that moment sometimes is that we can inherently start to feel good about what we do. And anything that makes us feel bad about what we do, we want to distance ourselves from. But again, this comes back to this two things can be true at once, right? That I can both be subjected to oppression while also being complicit and perpetuating it myself. And so that's true of us as an organization. And it's also true of the sector, right? Of the humanitarian sector, of the development sector, of the international sector, of the NGO sectors, of the charity sector. And this is something that we often like to remind our clients of, right? Is that just because you are working to alleviate some of this stuff, it doesn't mean that you're not perpetuating it also. And we can ask, we can, we can, we can all kind of sit with this statement, I think, for for, for some time as well. Um, from from Beverly Daniel Tatum, who you may be familiar with with her work. Can we move to the next slide? I'm going to talk a little bit about our approach organizationally in terms of working with with organizations like with organizations networks like the INEE. Um, can we go to the next? I'm going to I'm going to go to another another quote, another really delicious quote that we sit with quite often in our practice, and this really captures so much of of why we do what we do and how we do what we do. Is that not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced from James Baldwin. Um, for, for our work as an organization, and this is how we started with the INEE, we, we start with a period of deep listening and exploration. So before we start to do anything in an organization or in a space, we will typically seek to understand what is the context of the space that we are engaging with, what is already happening, what has already happened, what's painful, what are the emergent issues? Because one of the things that we know in a, in a network of 19,000 people, we're not gonna tell anybody anything new, right? As a, as a consultant coming in to support this practice is we understand our job is to bring together and organize potentially what is already emerging. And I wanna come back to what Rachel said at the beginning is that the Raja is in the room as a collective because of the critical organizing and emotional labor of the members and staff already existing at the INEE. They are the reason that we are here. So we're not coming in cold. That tells us that there is already knowledge. That tells us that there is already expertise. That tells us that there is already a knowing in the organization that we need to tap into and understand. So what we seek to do is through our period of deep listening, we, we undertake a series of surveys and we, we offer multiple feedback loops for members, for staff, for even the steering group. So for the, for the governance spaces within, within um, the INE also, we look at the whole ecosystem. If we leave out any part of the ecosystem, we are likely to be back here needing to repeat this work in a period of time. So for us, when we conducted our analysis, that period of deep listening took some time for us. It did take some time, making sure that we were asking the right questions, making sure that we were bringing everybody along on the journey. But interestingly, our findings from that survey very much reflected very similarly to what Shayon found from his minimum standards review. There is a whole host of overlap so for example, what does it mean for us to be translating versus generating in, an, in, an, in, in the original language, right? And for, for those of us in the room that might be bilingual, multilingual, polyglots probably in this room, I imagine, um, what does it mean for us to constantly be translating from rather than just allowing ourselves to speak, right? And what does that do to knowledge when it gets scrambled in that way, right? It's kind of like scrambling an egg. You can't quite unscramble it. How we might structure ideas, how we might organize ideas. That came through from a very in-depth technical review of the minimum standards. And it also came through our review 
of the lived experiences of the members and the staff. There is, there is again, what you can start to see emerging then is this consistency in what is happening systemically in how we're even conceptualizing things before we've even stepped into the room. Um, I wanna talk a little bit if we go on to the next slide. Um, so just talking about what it means to work with us, right? Is quite often we can, organizations will come to this work once. They will find the budget, they will come to this work once. That's a lot of pressure for us as a team to know that actually the, the, that the organization might have scrambled for a small consultancy, got together their monies and they're never gonna look at it again for 10 years, right? We have to work on the assumption that an organization will not touch this again because it's unpopular, it's undesirable and it's not seen as core to practice. We, we try to set up our work so that actually we're leaving, leaving organization or the network in this case with some capacity to keep iterating their change. So for us, we, we do that deep listening and understanding first. So we seek to do that analysis and to look at the whole ecosystem. We then seek to move into like a deep and critical period of learning and development, because how are you gonna change something you don't understand? This is one thing that we, we see organizations skipping a lot, and it might be something that you wanna consider as a group of people that are thinking about decolonization organizationally, is how are we embedding deep and critical learning as part of this work? And how might we be creating an ecosystem where we can do iterative change, right? Where actually, you know, there can be so much work galvanizing people into work that we then have an action plan, a roadmap or a piece of work that then is so fixed and defined that in six months time when it's not working for us anymore, we can't move from it. How might we be able to design things with enough flex for us to be able to be responsive for those community needs so that we're not coming back full circle into where we were in the first place. I'm just gonna share very briefly a few of um, core tenants that we, we work with um, in, our, in our practice as an organization. We welcome discomfort. This exploring power and our own role within, within, within the ecosystem that we're seeking to change is is hard and it is risky particularly for those with lived experience of oppression but we welcome the discomfort right if we hide from the discomfort we'll never get through it and so for our organizational practice we don't work with shame i can't lie sometimes i want to shame people nobody in this room nobody within this within the INE, but we hold it back because it's we can't learn in a space of shame and guilt right that comes at tension sometimes with the next piece of, of exploring power and privilege, right? Of thinking about what power and privilege might mean. We seek to work with collective curiosity that this is a collective endeavor and hopefully the INEE has really experienced that, that actually this is a shared journey. We don't have the answers, neither do you. Let's, let's see where we can land and walk together. And again, we seek to balance the system and the individual through a really trauma-informed approach, right? So actually, while, while we recognize that this is systemic, we do have an individual responsibility to, to move and make change. And how might that show up with, with, with meaning, with care? Um, for now, I'm going to stop there for now.